Well, a very warm welcome to you all and thank you for joining this webinar, as Mir's pointed out, on uh, ransomware and cyber attacks. And I'm joined here with an amazing panel who are going to take you through various areas in relation to ransomware. Well, of course, you're here today with us. This is part of Charity Fraud Awareness Week, which is bringing together everyone involved in charity and not-for-profit sectors to raise awareness and particularly to share good practice in tackling fraud and indeed financial crime. And we'd really encourage you to share this webinar with any of your colleagues and also the resources that you're going to see um, as we go through, not just today's webinar, but of course, the whole of the presentations that you're seeing so far and are yet to see. So like I say, we've been joined by a panel, which you can see the presenters on the screen. I will introduce them individually when they come to do their sections in relation to, to ransomware. But just really to, to set the scene, first of all, what I'd like you to do basically is if there are any questions, if you want to leave those in the Q&A box, in the Q&A box, you'll be able to raise any questions. Of course, we'll try and answer as many of those as we can at the end of the session. We will be going to a panel session, so we'll be able to get our experts to give us more of an insight into the areas that you're particularly interested in. And of course, we're here today to talk about the theme of ransomware. Um, it was only just last night that I was actually talking at a, an, an evening event uh, in relation to cybercrime. And of course, ransomware was probably the most popular topic of the evening. And so having done a bit of a scouting around, I know we've got other people, so I don't want to steal their thunder to talk to us about ransomware. But I mean, to the recent situation we've all found ourselves in around the world in relation to the pandemic, we have seen some quite frightening statistics in terms of cybercrime. Um, and I was looking at a report recently from Microsoft. Um, this is one that they produced at the beginning of this year. And it was quite startling that they were talking about socially engineered phishing attacks, which basically were aimed at getting people to click on that link to open up a, uh, a particular PDF or a Word document, which invariably related in ransomware. They were to increase by up to <clears throat> excuse me, 10,000 a day. And their statistics showed that ransomware attacks internationally, this is according to Microsoft, were up by over 800 percent. So that's quite a startling statistic. And of course, you're going to hear more and ransomware is going to be explained to you in a lot more detail by Becker, but it's not new. Ransomware has been with us for a number of years. Indeed, the first ransom attack was in 1989 with what was called the AIDS Trojan. And that was one where basically to pay the ransom demand, you'd actually put the money in the post to get obviously to get your data back. Things have changed significantly today. And the examples that we're reading about more and more in the media are very significant in terms of the attack, the damage it's doing, and of course, the monies that people have to pay. I was also scouting around just some intel in relation to the typical times people are down. This is downtime as a result of ransomware. And according to Mindcast from their 2021 survey, it's around about six working days. So again, it's not just the impact of having to pay the ransom demand, it's the amount of time that your systems are obviously unoperational. So you without the data, you're unable to operate. And that can have a huge impact, no matter what size the organization. And just the final thing before I hand over to Becker and introduce Becker is, one of the questions I get asked a lot, and I'm sure this is across the board is, well, if you are infected, do you actually pay the ransom demand? And it wasn't that long ago that we heard the story of TravelX. And of course, TravelX were hit in 2020 with a variant of ransomware and they indeed did pay the demand that was 2.3 million sterling but of course it was then relayed in a cryptocurrency in bitcoin so there are many stories out there where people have paid or haven't paid but let's find out more about this in a lot more detail so I have the privilege of handing you over to Becca Kay. Now, Becca is the go-to person at the National Cybersecurity Centre for all things charity. The National Cybersecurity Centre is here to make the UK the safest place to live and work online. So her main goal is to get charities cyber savvy, making them resilient against all types of cyber attack. So I'd have the pleasure now in handing you over to Becca. Becca, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you very much, Stephen. That was a really great introduction. And thank you so much for inviting me to come and talk to you all today. Um, I suppose you don't always think about cyber, uh, cyber crime being... being a part of fraud, but I think about 80 percent it's really important that we start to talk about. Um, and today I'd really like to talk to you definitely about ransomware. And I'm sure that you've heard a little bit about ransomware attacks on the news. Um, so I wanted to tell you a bit about what, what a ransomware attack is, um, you know, how it happens, 
and also what you can do if you find out that you are um, a victim of a, a ransomware attack. So a, a ransomware attack is when a cyber criminal has managed to get into your system in some way and encrypt it, either some or all of the other things that are online in your system. Um, and then once they've done that, they'll demand a ransom so that you can get access back into your system. Um, and it's not just like your, your emails. We're finding examples where um, like phone lines aren't accessible, um, even like logging um, swipes into buildings. So we've recently, there's, um, there's been lots of attacks in for universities and colleges with the most recent one that you may see in the news, um, Sunderland University. Um, and it's, it's meaning that the entire university is unable to operate um, until they've recovered from it. So they make it so that you, they, they, they really affect the way that your uh, charity works so that you're desperate to get back online, ask you for money. And because in your desperation, most organizations will try and pay this ransom. So then of course they've got their, they've got their money and they've won and they're off to the next victim, unfortunately. Um, so the way that this, um, this cyber attack will work, the first part is that they'll find a way into your system. So there are many different ways that they can do that. They could try and um, brute force a password. So that's just trying the, all the most common passwords to get into your, um, your system remotely. So that's about 50% of ransomware attacks are through that way. Or they may send um, a phishing email, as, as Stephen mentioned earlier. This sort of could be quite. They're they're, uh, they're becoming much more clever in how they um, they develop these emails. Um, they might look into the background of the organisation, try and make it look realistic. Maybe it's something that you're expecting. Um, then, of course, you click on it, and this um, malware. Uh, so this is software that that has this ransomware. Um, action on it um, gets downloaded into your system. Finally, the third way that they might get in is through any kind of known vulnerabilities. So if you haven't been patching your devices, and we don't just mean your laptops, but any kind of servers, VPNs, anything that is um, accessing the internet needs to all be kept up to date and patched. And so that's another way they'll find that vulnerability and get into your network that way. OK, right now, once they're in, they found their way into your system. They'll have a real good look around. The first thing they'll look for is uh, can they access your backups, any kind of backups? So they'll, they'll make sure they've got access to your backups first. Then they'll have a look. Have you got any sensitive data that we might be interested in, information on, on, on individuals, people? Um, so that'll be the second thing that they try and find. And then they'll keep looking around and try and cause as much disruption as possible. At this point, they're not actually doing anything. It's all going on in the background. So they're, they're just trying to access as much as they can on your network. OK, and then so they'll once they've got all of this access throughout your network, they might even. Um, so we're seeing an increase in what we call exfiltrating data. So that sensitive data that they found on your network, they they may try and download that so they have access, so they have a copy of it themselves as well. Um, so they when they have this access to this data, it's you can't unfortunately you can't get it back from them. Um, so that's a big issue that we're seeing across ransomware attacks. At this point, we still don't. Most organizations don't even know that this is happening and they'll wait until a time when they know it's going to be quiet um, because it takes quite a lot of time to encrypt all the data. You, so usually on a Friday evening, they'll press go on their malware and it will slowly uh, what we call encrypt all of the systems. So this will essentially make everything look like gobbledygook. So you would not have any access to any of these systems. Um, and the first thing you might find when you wake up, when you get in on a Monday morning, someone will log in and you might see a note on your laptop or your computer saying, you've been hacked. We want X number of, power, X number of Bitcoins. Um, 
They might also tell you that they have some data um, and, and that sort of thing. So um, it's at that point where we all start to panic. We realize that this has happened, but they could have been in your network for, for quite a, it could be a number of days or weeks at this point. Um, and so that's, all, that's what happens in, in a ransomware attack that we're seeing more of happening more often now. Um, and it's at this point um, where you can make the most difference to, to how, you know, to, to how, the, how it impacts your charity. So the way that you respond will have a really great impact. If, you've ha if you have an incident response plan uh, in place that has all the key actions and the contacts and everything prepared, it will help mean that you can respond and recover more quickly. The chances are it's not going to be your IT department or the person who's going to be able to help recover that will actually get that first email. So you need to make sure that everyone knows what to do if they if there is a, if there's a response to a ransomware attack. So who do they contact? Um, so who do they call? How do they report it? And then this person who they report or this team, this uh, whoever it is that's, that they're reporting to, needs to know what to do next. And the first thing they should absolutely do is disconnect their system to make sure that if they are still, um, if they're still encrypting, if they're still exfiltrating data, we can stop them and try and minimize the impact. Okay, and then we need to have a look determine what happened, find out how did they get in, but also how are our backups? So have you got, are your backups okay? Um, have they managed to access them and have they been encrypted or not? Hopefully not, um, because at this point, if you have your backups, you can wipe all of the system and rebuild it using your backups I just I make it I'm simplifying it a little bit. It, it, it will be a lot more complicated than that if it does happen. So you need to make sure that everyone knows what, who to contact if they have any sign of any kind of cyber attack, so ransomware attack, or they see a suspicious phishing email, etc. So that everyone needs to know what to do if they see that happening. Okay. Okay, and then at this point, how do you recover? So um, have a look at think and think about how you may be able to recover. If you have um, cyber insurance, then to contact them, they may be, may be able to help you recover. Smaller organizations could go to somewhere, um, somewhere like, for example, Curry's who have a ransomware removal service, or you could contact um, cyber specialists. If there are signs that um, sensitive data has been taken off the system, it needs to be reported to the ICO within the within 72 hours of it happening. And then um, obviously you need to report it to the Charity Commission. You can contact Action Fraud as well. Um, if it's um, it's been a significant incident you could also contact the, the National Cyber Security Centre who may be able to, to help and support you um, in this case. Um, so I think that my final my takeaway for this pit is to make sure that you have a plan in place to prepare you in case of anything happening to your system. Um, later on, I'll talk to you about an action plan on how you can try and prevent it. But that's uh, it from me for now. That's uh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Rebecca, and perfect timing. So, well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to hand over now to Chris, Chris Hall. Uh, we're going to look at uh, Charity Digital's cyber incident, what happened and how it is discovered. Now, Chris is head of marketing at uh, Charity Digital, uh, a podcaster, a webinar host covering digital and marketing. He's always been interested in tech for good space, previously working on numerous startups with a cause where he excelled in driving grassroots media campaigns customer acquisition and rapid organic growth strategies to build sustainable communities. Chris is also an avid climate change campaigner traveling to Antarctica in 2016 as a storyteller for the 2041 Foundation and speaking at the United Nations as a sharing responsibility for the Planet Panelist, a very busy gentleman. Chris, the floor is yours. 
Yeah, Stephen, thanks very much. And uh, good afternoon as it is now, everybody. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you all today, not only as a, on such a pertinent topic, but also to be able to share a little bit of our story with you and hopefully share some learnings that come from that as well. Um, so back in January, um, an email account, uh, an email, one of our email accounts was breached by someone to pretend it pretending to be one of our clients. Um, and to this day, we still don't entirely know how it happened, um, but we, you know, we're about 75, 80, 85% sure that was most likely to be from a phishing attack. Um, some unauthorized emails were sent from the account that was hacked, um, and some files were accessed from the account as well, with, with some of them containing limited personal data. You know, it turned out that the attackers had actually been lurking in the account for almost 10 days, which is, as, as Becca was just alluded to, there is, is often the way it happens. Um, and it actually managed to do quite a lot of damage in that time. Um, for example, they'd found and modified an existing invoice with new bank details and resent it to one of our partners. Um, they'd sent new bank deals to another, uh, new bank deals, sorry, to another partner who also had an unpaid invoice. So they clearly done a bit of background about what we do. Um, and we were able to use that um, to, to sort of amplify what they, what they were able to, or what they were trying to steal from us. Um, and they kept sending multiple emails to, to those partners to encourage them to pay both those invoices. Now, as well as sort of the reputational damage that comes with us from the sector, from the charity sector specifically, we, you know, our funding model is heavily reliant on our partners. Um, so we were a potential risk of a lot of credibility there, if not handled pro uh, properly, as well as the, the financial risk that come with that. I think we, was, we told it upwards of sort of £30,000, um, which is not insignificant uh, for a charity of our size. Um, so a lot of risk that come with that as well um, from something so simple as a phishing email. Um, but I just want to step back a little bit and talk about how we discovered it. Um, and I think the learnings we can we take from this is that it was all about looking for for specific signs and what was happening and and throughout that we actually identified that we had we had three clear signs that that really helped us identify uh, what was happening. The first signs were that the email of one of the staff staff members was behaving really oddly. Uh, our CEO was talking to them and he said emails weren't going into their inbox, they were going somewhere else. Um, you know, we talked about getting that looked at because it doesn't say, uh, sound right, but um, it actually didn't cause too much alarm within the team. And um, this was kind of the first sign of the breach. Just, you know, sometimes it happens, the emails do go a bit dodgy, whether it's Outlook, Gmail or any of the, the other ones, you know, and then they, they happen to fix themselves. Um, what actually was happening is was that the attacker would gained access to the email system and they'd actually set up a bunch of inbox rules in the back end. Um, so you actually can't see what is happening. They send they are sending emails from that inbox and then diverting any incoming emails to, to their own. Um, and, and they're actually deleting all the signs of their actions as well as they go along, which finds it, which makes it incredibly difficult to sort of pinpoint and, and understand exactly what's happening, makes it look exactly just like a bit of a dodgy inbox. So it's really important that if anyone you know is experiencing this is to take take action immediately you know if if your emails are acting a little bit odd figure out what it is if there's no sort of definitive reason for it this is when someone might be in your system um, and you don't know how long you've been doing that how long you've been there for sorry um you know as we said it, it it's it had been like this for, for 10 days from our point of view and we'd had 10 days without any action, um, which was, you know, it's just quite scary to think about that. The second sign was when our CEO received an email from that employee, uh, that employee whose email had been hacked um, with an attachment that looked like a new purchase order from one of our clients. Um, we actually all, most of us within the company um, received this as well or within the org received this as well. And it looked e extremely legitimate. Um, you know, we suspected nothing and, and uh, clicked on it. I just, I'll say you actually suspected nothing and clicked on it. Um, and it was our antivirus that stepped in, blocked access to the link and reported as a dangerous link. From there, immediately emailed the employee to ask if they had really sent it um, and got no reply on the email, which was an important second point because of the inbox rule and that I've just been talked about. You won't get a reply as the person you send it to won't see it. Um, so we actually were able to, you know, speak to that uh, employee in person, and that's what sort of raised awareness again. You know, we all get lots of these types of emails, lots of these sort of spam phishing emails, and 
if you know the person, it's always better to have that face-to-face -face conversation with them than try and email with them. Um, and of course, always forward any of the, 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 the phishing emails to reportfish.gov.uk, the amazing link that's been set up by the NCSC. The third and final sign, um, which was only a short time later, was that because of our relationship with the NCSC, Cub, uh, uh, Becca's predecessor, actually called our CEO uh, to say that he thought the account had been compromised. Um, as he received the same email and attachment that both Jonathan and, and myself had. Um, from here, we were able to, to really start our investigation and really start to assess the extent of what happened. But as I said, it was 10 days later. So how do we do that? How do we start by going, like, what exactly is happening? So we started assessing the Office 365 logs, looking for strange IP addresses, looking for the emails sent and actions taken, looking for files and the data accessed. Um, we considered any other applications that might have been accessed as well. Um, we started to check any logs for critical systems that might have been accessed, um, particularly those ones that we had without MFA on multi-factor authentication. Um, we also use Okta, which enables sort of complex random passwords to be stored for each system, and it's it's useful to have a well-protected system, so that helped us in, in a lot of cases. Um, and we actually found no evidence of other systems intercepted, but did reset some further passwords to be on the safe side. And we obviously restored a lot of the deleted files from Office 365 as well to give us a, a good over, oversight of the extent of what's happening. And this was actually a really useful process um, and told us, it told us, like, it gave us like a blueprint of exactly what had happened. Found lots of access from the USA and Ethiopia, lots of browsing within the um, within the account itself, and access to some, but a fairly limited set of set of files, which included some data. Um, you know, we we noticed that with the the inbox rules had been set up, there was over fifty two spam emails sent, um, but we still didn't really know how the access was gained originally. Um, we couldn't confirm access to certain attachments and emails. Um, there was a couple of share files tracked as well. So we, we took the, the line of assuming that any attachments that were included in emails had been accessed as well. And from there, having, having known what we were dealing with, we were able to start to formulate a sort of plan of action. Um, and we did quite a lot in the first six hours. Um, we contacted all 52 farm, uh, spam recipients as soon as possible to warn them. And we actually did that on the same day. We briefed our board subcommittee that we have set up for, for any risk initiatives um, within 24 hours and had a particular discussion around potential data breach and how we wanted to handle going forward. Um, and as I said, we were set lots of passwords and reported uh, the malicious link to the, to the reports at phishing.gov.uk. Um, we were also aware that we would need to report the data breach as a matter of urgency, as Becca said, with, within 72 hours. Um, so we actually contacted the ICO hotline to discuss our situation. Uh, they asked us a lot of questions, but didn't necessarily take any organization details. Most of the queries were to determine whether, the, whether we needed to formally notify the ICO of the data breach. So uh, a lot of our questions were around this point, discussions were around that point. The first questions kind of reassured us that um, we were that they were around whether the data contained healthcare data or financial data, which it didn't. So we know we didn't really cause any specific danger to the end user, um, and we weren't necessarily given an option on data breach reporting. But we were pointed to the sort of self-assessment notification form, um, which kind of allows us to record, make a record of it internally, and keep that on file and to, to change and flex if anything new comes to light. Um, from the discussions with the Board Risk Committee, we agreed that the data access was a low risk as predominantly organisation um, was, in, was in content. It couldn't be used to defraud, uh, for example. So it was, it was more the data we used to, to record from our, we, we capture from our content. Um, but there was a risk of a further phishing attack. So we agreed to voluntarily report within the first 72 hours, um, as we didn't really see a downside from doing this. Uh, the rest of the actions that followed out were kind of carried out within the next 10 days and um, we decided to increase our multi-factor authentication on all office accounts. Um, we fully briefed the board within eight days. Um, we sent a, a three emails out to contacts of eyes and of risk and we also ran a webinar as well. Um, so those three emails include those who had accessed, those who were in the file that have been asked, accessed, other potential files that may have been accessed, and all other charity digital subscribers as well. Uh, we spoke to Jerry, who's on this as well at the at the Mary Stevens Hospice, um, who had actually just been part of a podcast that we'd done talking about his own breach, which we'll get onto in a minute. 
um, and he helped us to develop our own plan as well. Um, we managed to retrieve, retrieve some of the deleted emails. And lastly, we notified all the employees immediately and set up um, in, in a weekly meeting um, and set up initial sort of extra vigilant activities to be more um, to be more aware of phishing. So the whole ordeal taught us quite a lot, um, but our key learnings, and I think what this proved to us as an organisation that talks to charities about the effects of cybercrime is that it really can happen to anybody. Um, it happened to us despite what we thought were reasonable levels of protection, and we class ourselves as a quite a cyber savvy organisation, yet the sophistication of cyber criminals beat us on that day. It is embarrassing, um, and there's no way you can get away from that. But we saw that as an opportunity to also um, share our learnings, own, own up to what had happened, own up to our frailties within our own systems, um, and use that to help other charities on their journey. Um, we learned that attackers are after two things, um, money, um, they want yours, and they want your donors, and they want personal data to target for fraud or to sort of perpetuate the next attack through phishing. And lastly, and I think what most importantly is that cybersecurity is like is like all things digital. It never stops evolving. You know, attackers are always finding new ways to be just terrible people. Um, and we need to, but you know, we need to match them. We need to look sort of further at our own own protection under the assumption that we will be breached again in the future, and therefore be able to contain the breach, um, any breach that we do have, and always have plans to address. Essentially, be one step ahead. That's great, Sorry, Chris. I've run over there. That's great. If I could just, <laughs> yeah, if I could just there. Thank you very so much, Chris, and thank you for being so honest with that that case study there. Because what I'd like to move on to now is to talk to or get Jerry to talk to us. This is Jerry Crow, um, and Jerry is basically going to do his session looking at the Mary Stevens Hospice, uh, the incident, what happened, and how it was discovered. And we're really grateful that Jerry's agreed to be with us here this morning or this afternoon, I should say. Jerry's the director of operations and support at the Mary Stevens Hospice. Jerry joined the Mary Stevens Hospice in January 2015 after an extended career in the British Army, where he served in a variety of roles in numerous countries, too many to list here today, and on the majority were of well-known military operations. As the Director of Operations and Support at St Mary's Hospice, Jerry is responsible for estates and facilities, HR, IT, data security, and a whole host of other functions that support the hospice to achieve its aims of providing specialist care for people who are living with incurable illness and their families. Again, another very busy man. So, Jerry. The floor is yours. Cheers, Stephen. Thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'll say, unlike Chris, I'm not, a, I'm not a professional blogger, so I may not come over quite as good as him. Um, bit of background to us, because I think it's worth getting this background. We are a small charity, and like all the other charities out there, we're trying to do good for other, other people. And we all work on a shoestring. Um, so... I'll go back to when we were hacked, but prior to us being hacked, we couldn't afford to spend money on data protection, on cybersecurity. And actually, we were most of us were of the opinion, we're so small, we're insignificant, a hacker is never going to come after us. However, we were very wrong, and we've learned a lot from that. So what actually happened, I was working from home. It was a Wednesday. A member of staff phoned me at home and said, look, I think one of our computers has been hacked. What do we do? So instantly I said, right, pull the cable out of the back so it's not in contact with anyone else. Phoned our computer company because we have no internal support and said to them what happened. And then the ball started rolling. So that was on the Wednesday. Um the reason the staff thought a computer had been hacked or something was wrong was she was getting lots of calls from people about an email she'd sent out. So the first person who phoned, she thought, well, they've made a mistake, it's someone else. The second person, that's strange, everyone's making the same mistake. The third person, it was the world's gone mad. And then fourth, fifth was actually, there's something wrong here. So her computer had been hacked. What had happened the previous day, and we didn't realise it, obviously, till we spoke to her, she had received an email. It looked, it looked authentic. It looked like it came from Microsoft, and it said to her she needed to change her password. So it came up with a screen, please enter your personal details and enter your current password, which she did, and nothing happened. 
And she said when I was chatting to her, well, I just thought it went wrong, so I didn't think about it. But what she had done by clicking on that link when she thought she was going to Microsoft, she had given the hacker her details to log on to the system and her current password. Um, so after the computer had been locked, locked down, our IT company looked at it. And again, I'm not an IT expert, but it's very similar to Chris. It transpired that the hacker had changed the rules on her computer. So, and the hacker had been on the system then. We were quite lucky. The hacker had only been on the system for 24 hours. Um, that person was sending emails out to everyone on her contact list and even people who weren't on her contact list and probably picked up from emails on, on her uh, system. Um, if they responded to her, that email wasn't going to her, that was automatically being transferred to another account that the hacker was actually receiving and reading. So potentially, that could have gone on for days and days, potentially, but we were very lucky we actually caught it within 20, 20, 24, yeah, excuse me, 24 hours. So we thought, this is serious, we've got to look at it, but it's not the end of the world. All the hacker's done is looked at her emails. Now, like probably every other charity now, we had policies, we had procedures, we knew about data protection, we knew about GDPR, but it was just documents that sat on files because that was someone else's business, it wasn't ours. When I actually sat down the following day when I went into work, I realised how serious this was because she had a mass of personal data on her system. It wasn't password protected. It had credit card details, CCV numbers, and a whole host of things. Um, I then got very worried about it, spoke to the senior leadership team, and initially the thoughts were, let's keep it in-house but I was inside, I was very worried. So I then phoned the ICO, the Information Commissioner's Office, but being a bit of a coward, I, I, I went through, first of all, as an anonymous phone call, and I spoke to them, told them what happened. They, they didn't push me for, for my details. They were quite understanding. They were talking real calmly. And the conversation added with the operator I was speaking to said, ask yourself two questions. Number one, why wouldn't you report it? And number two, what's going to happen to you if someone else reports it? So I then took that message back to the senior leadership team. And even though not everybody was in agreement, we decided we had to go official. I then phoned the information commissioner's office back, told them officially who I was, where I was phoning from, what had happened, and they were absolutely fantastic they gave us lots and lots of advice told us what we should do to limit uh, the, the actual effects of what had happened and at the time i know there were lots of rumors that the ico were actually horrors if you reported anything they'd come after you we didn't have that experience at all they were really really very helpful when we looked at it there was the potential that the hacker had had access to up to 35,000 donor details, including, in a lot of cases, credit and debit card details. Um, I'll go on on the next section to tell you about what we did, but what we did cost us about 15,000, just in excess of 15,000 to put right, which is a lot of money for a charity. However, had we not reported it, and someone else had reported us to the ICO, and we were found to be covering up, it would have cost us possibly, because of the fines with GDPR, up to quarter of a million pounds. So we know we made mistakes, we've learned from our mistakes, and we're very keen to advertise those mistakes to other charities, because we're all in it together, we're all here to help each other out. And actually, if we can all battle the hackers, we've got a much better chance of beating them. Um, we, we lost some money, we lost a bit of reputation, but a lot of good came from it. So that really sums up what happened with us. And in the next section, I'll tell you what we did. So that's me, Stephen. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you ever so much, uh, Jerry, for that. So 
We've had three excellent presentations there, giving you an insight in terms of hopefully what uh, ransomware attack is. Also looking at the implications when it comes to what to do from the two case studies that we both saw, that we all saw there from our two speakers, Chris and Jerry. So in this session here, what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to Becca and we're going to look at three golden roles of prevention and free resources, tips and resources that are available from the National Cyber Security Centre's website. So Becca, I'll hand back to you. Sorry, didn't realise, still on mute then. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. I hope that's given you a real good uh, back understanding of ransomware attacks. And so there's three three things that, um, that, that we think that would be the most effective actions for you to do to try and reduce the chances of being a victim of a cyber attack. So first of all, it's to make sure that you have a backup that's separate to your system. Um, so either um, on the cloud or having it on a separate, um, you can have a separate um, hard drive or something that's disconnected. Um, and then make sure that the passwords that you use to access these backups are different to the, uh, to the passwords and the access that you use for the rest of your system. And that means that they, it'll make it much more difficult for them to, um, to interrupt your backups. Secondly, um, make sure that you check what we call RDP settings. That's your remote desktop protocol. So um, that's um, a protocol, that's um, a setting that allows you to remotely access your system. So half of ransomware attacks get through the RDP port onto your network. And sometimes, even if you're not using the RDP port, um, it might be switched on anyway. Um, if you need to use RDP, make sure that you're using the multi-factor authentication so that there's like two gateways or more to get into it and to get in when you're accessing remotely and make sure that everyone's using good, strong passwords. If you don't know what RDP is, how to find it, how to figure out, um, you know, whether or not it's switched on, um, the, the NCSC has a free tool called Early Warning, and this should have a hyperlink when we share out um, this slide later on. Um, and this is there to alert you of vulnerabilities or any signs of potential cyber attacks on your system. So alongside that, make sure that your devices are patched so that there are no vulnerabilities or as few vulnerabilities as possible for them to get through. We also offer just for charities and the public sector, so charities are really lucky, are other tools, um, web check and mail check. So that can help you to avoid any uh, website or email scams. So it's picking up vulnerabilities in your network with early warning, and your website with web check and in your email system. So it can let you know if, for example, an attack like, uh, like what happens to uh, the charity digital, you, you'd be able to get a warning that it's happened much sooner. Or And it will also alert you of any vulnerabilities that could make that a possibility. I've also added a link on any of the latest guidance and information on ransomware attacks. So if you can just keep that, um, pin it onto your... Um, pin it and keep it and that will give you the latest updates um, we'd really love to hear from charities who are willing to talk about their experiences um, it, uh, a ransomware attack could happen to anyone and there's also a type of ransomware attack called a zero day attack so that means we wouldn't identify um, so it's like new software that they're using so it makes it much more difficult to detect if they're on your system. So it's made it, they, they try and make it more, uh, they're, they're making it more and more easy to break into your system. So it's not your fault if it happens, um, but we'd really love to hear from charities who've experienced an attack um, and want to share their experiences with others, how they recovered or you know what they did, the lessons that they've learned, um, so that we can really help to cut down the risk of cyber attacks across the charity sector. Um, so yeah, our top three, Offline backups, checking your remote desktop protocol settings, getting all those good strong passwords in, in place and uh, making sure that you're cutting back on the vulnerabilities using our early warning tool and making sure everything gets patched as soon as possible. OK, that's it for me. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Becca. Right, so we're at the stage now where we're going to, um, I've got a couple of questions that I actually want to ask a couple of our speakers, and then I appreciate we've had some questions that have come through. Some of the questions that have come through have already been answered. So if you look at the Q&A, if there were similar questions you'd be raising, they are actually in that section there. But the first question I'm going to, first of all, address to Jerry, and then I'm going to get Chris to give me sort of his view on this. But uh, Jerry, if I could ask you this first of all, and that's, uh, what impact did the cyber incident have on your charity, particularly the reputation, um, also your staff morale? These are things that tend to get forgotten about. And I know that obviously that you'll be able to share your experiences there. Of course, the financial impact. How did you manage it, including obviously who you reported it to? I know you mentioned the ICO, yeah. but was there anybody else we'd need to think about? So, Jerry, if you wouldn't mind, just. OK, fine. You know, as you said at the start, Stephen, we reported it to the ICO. We reported it to the Charity Commission. We reported it to Action Fraud. And at the time, again, there were rumours that it's pointless reporting anything to action fraud because you never hear anything back. Mm -hmm. The next day, the West Midlands police were on the phone to us and we kept in contact with them. So we did a lot of reporting. Reputationally, that was one of our biggest worries, reputationally and financially, what is going to happen to us? If I could say, we, even to this day, we're still not certain that the hacker took all of that data or read that data, but... We couldn't be 100% certain they hadn't. Mm. So when we wrote to, as I said, in excess of 35,000 people, we decided there'd be one point of contact for every call, every email, anyone calling in, and that was me. And I'll be honest with you, some of them, quite rightly so, were very upset, wanted nothing to do with us anymore ever again. And our database of 35,000 over the next couple of months just dropped off a lot. Mm. What we then realised was actually we had this massive database. We're writing to all these people, and most of them threw it in the bin anyway. So the database of people we kept were people who wanted to hear from us. So that's num number one. Um, financially, it didn't hit us at all. In fact, one of the ladies who she actually contacted me, it was a, a lovely email I spoke to on the phone. She said, thank you very much for being honest. Um I won't, I probably can't mention it here, but everyone's aware of there was a big company at the time who got caught out and didn't report it. We did report it. And she said um, her dad had died in the hospice years back, and she said, he made us promise to give you money, and I forgot to do it. I now want to send you £3,000. Yeah. So... And on the staff morale side, if we can just touch on that as you asked, hmm. there were lots of calls that we should sack the member of staff. And even now, from the webinar over a year ago, I have charities contact us. What do we do? Well, actually, what we've got is we've got a really open charity. Everyone is going to make a mistake. One day I'm going to click on it. And actually, if I'm scared of being disciplined or sacked, I am not going to report it. So... Yeah, and you know, it's going to happen to all of us. So we've got this really on induction. Everybody is told what happened to us. If this happens to you, report it, um, because it's not the reporting it where we will discipline people. All right. Okay. Thank you, Chris. If I could just sort of, uh, was there any impact on sort of staff morale within the organisation or reputation? Did you pick up anything there? Yeah, um, very similar story to, to Jerry's, to be quite honest. And I think there's a lot of learnings there for other charities that getting out ahead of this and being honest about it will, will mitigate a lot of the reputational damage that can come with it. I think we did a very similar thing. You know, um, we we held a webinar for our whole entire um, database to attend and learn to happen. Thankfully, it went down really well. And I think getting out in front of it and being honest and shown that we're real people who can also make mistakes um you know allows yourselves to, allowing ourselves to be a little bit vulnerable made people connect with us a little bit better um especially from the sense that we're saying before we are quite a cyber um sort of aware organization we have a lot of tech in place and some the 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 phishing email that came through looked so legitimate you know it it, it was it was almost um hard to ignore so we managed to you know, we managed to mitigate a lot of a, a lot of any sort of reputational damage by being honest. Um, from a financial point of view, we got very lucky, and I think that's that's again honest to say. We got very lucky in the sense that um, you know all of our clients are from the tech world, um, so we're quite aware of it, and we're 
we, you know, have have a lot of um, a lot of tech in place to be able to flag this sort of stuff. They were also very understanding. Again, very very lucky. Um, and we also didn't have any sort of dangerous personal information that that was breached. So we got lucky in that sense that we weren't implicated. Uh, but we took the right reporting steps, as I said, you know, before we voluntarily reported to the the ICO because we didn't see any mm. uh, any negative from doing that. Um, again, just getting out in front of it, being honest. Um, and I totally echo what Jerry said about the staff member. You know, we I don't think we even shared it with the rest of the organization. You know, we we rallied around that staff member and, and protected them. Um, because as Jerry rightly said, if if you know this mistake could happen to anybody, and if they're afraid to, to do things about if the rest of the organization becomes afraid to do about it before, you know, as I said, it's likely that we're gonna be fit, we're gonna be attacked again monthly, quarterly, yearly, that sort of thing. We need people to be on the on the front line fighting with us, not against us with that sort yeah. of thing. So so yeah, um I think we we were lucky and I think we class ourselves as lucky, but I also think we did the, we took a lot of the right steps. And I think mm. a lot of charities can learn from 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 Jerry and, and what mm. they did at the hospice, because I think taking that stance is it is incredible. Mm. So just thinking about those steps there, Chris, in terms of, sort of my next question is sort of what controls, I know you've mentioned some of them, but if you could just remind us, sort of what could you, you know, what did you put in place and what should people put in place to prevent a similar hap- uh, an incident happening such as yours in the future? Yeah. What, what could we do? Yeah, we did a lot in the short term, um, longer term, um, you know, I mentioned the report, I see we also reported action fraud, um, but going beyond that, we've actually done a lot since, so mm. we've provided regular, you know, data protection and security training for all employees, um, we deployed um, additional antivirus software, software uh, antivirus software on all machines, which had been in January, we were before this blended working has set up, so um, we made sure we carried all the new security measures forward in that blended work session. So not just having what the, the security level we have on machines in the office, but also devices at home as well. Um, we also broadened our use of, of multi-factor authentications um, to all applications. At, at the time it was on some, um, but for example, email is something it wasn't on. Um, so we've now expanded that to all applications that are being used by the organization. Um, we totally audited and reviewed and overhauled our internal data storage access and security policies um so the main point was like the main point out that was not the share sharepoint and attachments that sort of thing even when in the organization anything with secure data on it needs a password on it and those passwords need to follow specific rules that sort of thing um one thing we found quite important because generally Mm. hackers are overseas so we actually put a login block from access from uh login blocked access from outside of the uk Mm. so unless specifically requested by staff which is i think a big thing that's helped as well um and we've strengthened our uh, inbound email scanning so one fun thing that we do i say fun um (laughs) in the looks terms is we'll do like like regular phishing checks so you know our our it resource in-house will send a phishing email around every sort of couple of weeks to, to two to two months to see who's on the ball, who needs more training, that sort of thing to make sure things are being flagged so it's not forgotten about. Um, so that, among a few other things we've done just to make sure people are paying attention to it. Mm-hmm. And, and lastly, we've also put in sort of quarterly security reviews. Um, this process is kind of in place to monitor just generally the threat landscape um, and consider any changes that, that we might need to put. And that includes talking to the likes of Becca and Jerry, to be quite honest, and, and understanding where this where the cybersecurity sector is at from a from a threat level at any given time, and also hearing from other charities as well. We produce loads of content on this, yeah. um, and as Becca rightly called out for before, we need more Jerry's in the world, you know, who are willing to talk about it and willing to to own up to the embarrassment a little bit. Through that is is how we get to learn a little bit more, how we get there. Mm. That's a very, a very, very good point. And thank you so much for that, Chris. A very, a very strong point there. So, Jerry, is there anything else that uh, you'd want to add to that in terms of, you know, what you've done since your experience? Yeah, um, obviously, a lot of what Chris has said, we, we've we done as well. Um, we haven't got our own, we're not IT experts. None of us are IT, and I'm definitely not an IT expert. Um, but we've stressed that even though people see me as the sort of point of contact for cyber data security, mm. 
everybody owns it every single person in this building so it's a standard agenda item on our board of trustees meetings mm. they want to know um we stopped any of our work emails being forwarded to personal email accounts um because that's how the hacker transferred things to him or her um and even though staff complained about it well i, I want to read it when i'm a holiday well guess what you're on holiday you okay. don't read it it's as simple as that um we um are then started phishing emails similar to what chris spoke about but we can't do it ourselves so we use an outside company who do it with us um when we started i think the charity average for clicking on a phishing email is something like 28 percent, if i remember right we were at 30 something percent we're now down to five percent um now some of the staff say it's really hateful what you do it's very frightening and my answer is well hackers are frightening they don't care about it um and everybody is on the lookout so since we were hacked we believe we've had five other potential attempts where you know emails have come in we've gone to our computer and people just stop i've got this i don't know what to do with it we speak to our IT company, they come remotely on to look at it, and they say, yeah, absolutely, we will dispose of that. Um, and, and basically, we just we, we just keep talking about it. On induction, we talk about it. On our staff meetings, it's, it's not a taboo subject. It's not something that anyone's afraid about, really. Mm. Yep. I think that's a very good point there in terms of communication. I think that's what both Chris and yourself echoed. And just one point that you, you mentioned there, Joe, which I know having worked with the ICO over the years, um, well, done presentations with them, they always talk about who's responsible for data security, who's responsible for cybersecurity. People try and pigeonhole individuals in the organization, mm -hmm. but the response they're expecting to hear is it's everybody's responsibility. It doesn't matter which level you're at within the organization. And if you actually do, you, I think you can still do them for free. The ICA will do a health check for you. They, they send two yeah. people down for two or three days. They'll randomly select staff and ask them questions. One of those questions, who's responsible for uh, data, data security in this organization? And if they say, oh, it's Jerry, that would be the wrong answer because they want to hear it's everybody. Mine, the person that works out front, the person that works in the, you know, the ivory towers, it's everybody's responsibility. I want to close, first of all, by thanking all of our panelists here today, for Becca, for Jerry and for Chris. And I really do hope it's given you an insight into the area of ransomware. We've picked up quite a bit on phishing as well, which obviously is a going concern and it's given you food for thought. Now, of course, in relation to resources, you've got uh, a slide in front of you now, which is preventcharityfraud.org.uk. You can go to the website to get a wealth of information. We've already had Becca talk about the National Cybersecurity Centre, and indeed, by going to their website, having used it myself, there's an awful lot of information. And I think within the charity movements itself, it's the more people talk. It's coming back to what Jerry was saying and being more open and talking about it. So amongst your communities, it's best, you know, it's looking at what is best practice? How did you react to this? What did did you do there it's all about coming together and not being afraid not being ashamed of what's happened and I just wanted to again pick up on one of the points which uh, both the gents looked at and that's in relation to you don't make someone feel the scapegoat for a particular cyber attack and all the pressures on them and that person should be got rid of because if that message gets out that if you basically do something that you shouldn't do you're going to be fired of course if someone knows they have done something and both of the gentlemen picked up on this you're not going to have it reported because they're going to be protecting their job. And sometimes organizations want to protect the reputation of the organization, but it's all about being open, upfront and honest about it and sharing, as I say, this information amongst yourselves. Well, that's really all I wanted to say in closing, apart from thanking you, the audience, for watching. As I say, I do hope it's been informative. Uh, continue uh, joining us on the sessions throughout the week as part of the Charity Fraud Awareness Week, which is a joint initiative with initiative the Fraud Advisory Panel and indeed the Charity Commission. So on behalf of uh, the Charity Commission and the Fraud Advisory Panel, my name is Stephen Hill, and I'd like to say thank you very much and take care. Stay safe. Thank you.